All right, folks, here we go. We're going to talk about hormonal control and uh, concentrating the urine or actually making copious amounts of dilute urine either way. I want to back up and talk about filtration again, uh, mainly because the hormones we're going to be talking about affect blood pressure and therefore affect filtration. Uh, recall from the last part of the, the last mini lecture that this glomerular hydrostatic pressure, i.e. blood pressure, the glomerulus is a capillary, that's blood. Well, the capillary is the vessel that holds the blood. So glomerular hydrostatic pressure is really just blood pressure. And that's the driving force of pushing of fluid out of the blood and into the filtrate. Let's say that's 50 millimeters of mercury. Well, we have a couple opposing pressures. We have these albumin molecules, the major plasma proteins albumin. So it, there's other ones, but the major one's albumin. These albumin molecules uh, exert an osmotic pressure on the fluid that you just pushed out, and they recall it or pull it back in. And let's say that blood colloid osmotic pressure is 25. Well, you got 50 pushing out and 25 pulling back. That's a net filtration pressure of 25. 50 minus 25 is 25. But in addition, you have this capsular hydrostatic pressure pushing back in. So if you have a net filtration pressure right now of 25, but you subtract the 15, then you only have a net filtration pressure of 10 right there. That's 10. And you can see 10 is not that big a is not that much so this blood pressure is very important you're only winning and when I say winning you're only filtering by 10 millimeters of mercury if your blood pressure drops you're gonna have far less filtration and the and the waste products are gonna stay inside your bloodstream all right so blood pressure is very important that it stay within a normal range in addition you don't want blood pressure that's too high because you could damage this filtration membrane and this is one of the reasons why we sometimes see blood in the urine because your filtration membranes have been damaged by high blood pressure and now that 90 nanometer fenestra and the 9 nanometer filtration slits they're big gaping holes because they've been ruptured and damaged and now um, not only can protein get into your urine which is really small compared to cells but cells can get in your urine and this is how sometimes you see uh, blood in your urine as you damage this filtration membrane so the bottom line is this you got you have to have high enough blood pressure or you don't filter and if you don't filter waste products stay in your blood but you don't want your blood pressure to be too high to damage your filtration membrane and therefore we have all kinds of control mechanisms uh, this is the auto regulation of blood pressure and what happens is we detect that we have a low glomerular filtration rate and the glomerular filtration rate is typically 125 125 mils per minute and by the way that should match up for you the uh, the 180 to 200 liters a day and let's just do that so if you have 125 mils a minute times 60 minutes so 125 times 60 that equals 7,500 mils 500 mils per hour times 24 because there's 24 hours in a day that equals 100 and 180,000 mils, which equals 180 liters. And that's what we said before, that we make about 180 liters. I always rounded it up to 200, but that's fine. Let's just make my math easier. We make about 180 liters of, of filtrate a day. Now, let's say this glomerular filtration rate drops. If it drops, a couple things happen. First of all, we dilate the afferent arterioles. We dilate these afferent arterioles and we increase the flow of blood into the glomerulus. We constrict the efferent arterioles and we decrease the flow out of the glomerulus. So if you're increasing the flow into the glomerulus and you're decreasing the flow out of the glomerulus, pressure builds up in the glomerulus. And when this pressure builds up in the glomerulus, uh, you have greater filtration. In addition, we have contraction of the mesangial cells. And the mesangial cells, uh, if you can recall, were part of this juxtaglomerular apparatus, and they contained gap junctions, and they were the, they were, uh, the key communication 
port between the juxtaglomerular cells of the afferent arterial and the macula densa cells of the distal convoluted tubule. So we have contraction of these mesangial cells, and that also leads, but not only does it lead to increased glomerular pressure, but it also can add to the renin angiotensin aldosterone story. S doesn't stand for story, it stands for system, but I just call it the story. Which is next? Now let's look at the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So this renin angiotensin aldosterone system, first of all, it can be turned on by the autonomic nervous system. So neurons can turn this on. Okay. Secondly, it can be turned on by a decline in blood pressure. So renin can be secreted by a decline in blood pressure. Renin can be secreted by stimulation of, of by the sympathetic uh, nervous system. All right. And lastly, renin can be secreted when there's a decline in sodium in the tu in the tubular fluid. Remember, the macula densa are some special cells in the distal convoluted tubule where it approaches the uh, Bowman's capsule. Well, why would there be a decline in sodium in the fluid? Because the filtrate flow decreases. Our nephrons are really good at conserving sodium. That means we reabsorb sodium. If we have, if the filtrate flow decreases, decrease filtrate flow, we have more time to reabsorb sodium. And we do. So if the filtrate flow decreases, we have more time to reabsorb sodium. We reabsorb the sodium, and sodium concentration in the filtrate drops below normal. The macula densa cells detect this as a low osmotic concentration in the filtrate. Well, why would the filtrate flow slow down? Because of lower glomerular filtration rate. Well, let's increase the glomerular filtration rate, okay? We already talked about one way we do this by uh, dilating the afferent arterioles and constricting the efferent arterioles, but the JGA also secretes renin. So all of these things lead to lead for me to secrete uh, renin. I should say renin, not renin, renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. So what we have is angiotensinogen being converted to angiotensin 1 by renin. Now, angiotensin 1 is a mild vasoconstrictor. It increases blood pressure a little bit. But it's not a potent vasoconstrictor at all. But no problem, because angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, right here. Now, angiotensin 2 does lots of things. All right. First of all, it's a potent vasoconstrictor. This increases blood pressure. So angiotensin II increases blood pressure. In addition, angiotensin II goes to the adrenal cortex and says, increase aldosterone. Aldosterone goes to the kidneys and says, increase sodium reabsorption. Water follows. Let me say that again. Aldosterone tells the kidneys to increase sodium reabsorption. Water follows. So we increase sodium in the blood and water follows. So we increase blood volume, which increases blood pressure. In addition, angiotensin II goes to the brain and it says, hey, you're thirsty. So you drink. That's good. Now you're adding fluid to your blood. In addition, angiotensin II goes to the hypothalamus part of the brain. By the way, it made you thirsty in the hypothalamus as well. The, your thirst centers in the hypothalamus. It goes to the hypothalamus and it says, increase ADH production and secretion. Remember, the hypothalamus makes ADH but stores it in the posterior pituitary. But the hypothalamus tells the posterior pituitary to release it. Antidiuretic hormone goes to the kidneys and says, increase water reabsorption, which increases blood volume, which increases blood pressure. 
All right. In addition, angiotensin 2 increases sympathetic tone. Now, this is a positive feedback because the sympathetic nervous system can lead to renin secretion, which ultimately leads to an increase of sympathetic nervous system activity. See that little positive feedback? So the increased sympathetic tone increases cardiac output, which increases blood pressure. All right. So all of this increases blood pressure and therefore increases my glomerular filtration rate and, and therefore increases my filtration and therefore speeds up filtrate flow, et cetera, et cetera. You might have heard of ACE inhibitors. That's that enzyme right there. If you have a relative that's on ACE inhibitors because they had a heart attack, they are on inhibitors of this enzyme right here. If you don't allow ACE to work, then you never convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and you never do all these things that increase blood pressure, which, if you had a heart attack, is a good thing. So that's why these ACE inhibitors, that's how they work. This is the collage showing you both the autoregulation and the um, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Now this picture shows you the same darn thing. Um, there's really nothing new in it. I will tell you this. Actually, there is something new in it. Look at how we classified some of these. So right here to right here is your auto-regulation. This is your auto-regulation, all of this stuff. All right, the blue and the tan. Well, there's two tans here. The blue and the, the myogenic and the tubuloglomerular. That's all auto-regulation. It's called intrinsic regulation or auto-regulation. All right. It's just saying that, look... Uh, we have a decrease in blood pressure. So what do we do? And there, that leads to a decrease in glomerular filtration rate. That leads to a decreased stretch in the afferent arterioles. The juxtaglomerular cells detect that. So what we do is we vasodilate the afferent arterioles. This leads to increased blood flow to the glomerulus, and it increases glomerular filtration rate. This is a myogenic mechanism because it's talking about the smooth muscles in the walls of the afferent arteriole. That's what it's talking about. All right. Now look at, look at this tubuloglomerular mechanism. We have a decrease in glomerular filtration rate. The macula densa cells t detect that there's low osmotic pressure in my distal convoluted tubule. Or this is saying the ascending limb of the lupa henle. It, it's... The end of the ascending limb of the lupa henle and the beginning of the distal convoluted tubule that approaches that glomerulus. So don't worry too much about which tubule approaches the glomerulus. It's the distal part of the ascending limb of the lupa henle or the proximal part of the distal convoluted tubule. It's right there at the junction, really. Well, there's only one reason why there's low sodium in your filtrate, and that's because the, f the filtrate's moving too slow and it's giving the mechanisms plenty of time to reabsorb sodium. My macula densa cells detect this. What they do is they vasodilate the afferent arterioles. All right. Now look at this. The granular cells of the JGA. These are the juxtaglomerular cells of the JGA. They secrete renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin. Well, it's going directly to angiotensin 2. Don't worry about that. The angiotensin 1 and the ACE converting it to angiotensin 2 is in there as well. It's just simplifying and going directly to 2. What does angiotensin 2 do? It tells the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone, which tells the kidneys to reabsorb sodium and water follows. That increases your blood volume, which increases your blood pressure. What else does angiotensin 2 do? It uh, has a positive effect on the systemic arterioles and vasoconstricts them and increases blood pressure. What else does angiotensin 2 do? Angiotensin 2 increases sympathetic autonomic tone or sympathetic tone, which is a positive feedback mechanism because the sympathetic nervous system itself can cause renin secretion. What else does angiotensin 2 do? It makes you thirsty, so you drink. What else does angiotensin 2 do? Not shown here, by the way. It increases ADH, which tells your kidneys to reabsorb water 
which increases your blood volume and increases pressure. So this whole thing happens to keep your pressure normal and keep your glomerular filtration rate normal. Aldosterone and ADH act on the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. That's where they act. Let me say that again. Aldosterone and ADH act on the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. Let me remind you that everything that's reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule and the lupa henle is obligatory. But everything reabsorbed in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct is facultative or variable. Well, what makes it variable or who controls this variability? And the answer is hormones, aldosterone and ADH. All right, this is showing you the proximal convoluted tubule. How do I know? Because it's purple right here. See that? Remember that 70% of your filtrate is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. So remember that. So this is showing you what's going on here. here here's the tubular fluid, and I'm reabsorbing sodium right here, and I'm reabsorbing glucose, and I'm putting it back into the bloodstream. All right. So here's the glucose in the bloodstream, here's the sodium in the bloodstream. Notice the keys that the dotted lines are passive diffusion and the um, solid lines are active. All right. Notice these keys right here. I have co-transport, I have an exchange pump, and counter-transport. So uh, you don't have to memorize everything that's active and passive. I want you to know that both are occurring. Both diffusion and active transport are occurring. Secretion is occurring. Look at right here, because this is the next chapter. This is, enti this is almost entirely the next chapter. Something that wasn't filtered, like a proton, an acid, can be secreted into my tubular fluid and urinated out. So if my blood slightly, obviously, obviously my blood pH is kept in pretty narrow narrow range 7.35 to 7.45 but if I get too acidic less than 7.35 I can secrete some of these protons and bring my blood pH back to normal look if I get too acidic I can reabsorb more bicarbs and which is a buffer and bring my pH back to normal and of course I reabsorb all this water now there is no active transport mechanism for water just so you know there's no such thing water simply follows salt water always goes from a hypotonic environment into a hypertonic environment this is how water travels from a hypotonic into a hypertonic so water follows salt in other words so if we want to reabsorb more water we reabsorb more sodium and water follows. Okay. So that's happening in the proximal convoluted tubule, and 70% of that reabsorption occurs. Now look at this. These transport molecules, this is transporting glucose, but it could be amino acids, it could be anything. These transport molecules have a transport maximum in other words if there's too much glucose in my filtrate this glucose transporter might not be able to handle it all and get it all out of there i mean it's not normal to have glucose in your urine we really we usually reabsorb it all back into our bloodstream i mean we ate that apple for a reason we want the glucose in our body but we do filter glucose it's small enough to be filtered but we reabsorb it all so no deal no no problem no big deal however if there's too much glucose in my tubular fluid, it it saturates this glucose transporter. And yes, I, I reabsorb as much as I can, but this is saturated. I've hit my I've hit my my transport maximum. All right, I've hit my transport maximum. I can't reabsorb anymore, and glucose remains in my tubular fluid, and I urinate it out. And then when I dip stick your urine in the lab, I can see that there's glucose in it. This is called a renal threshold. But saying the word renal threshold is tricky. Threshold is tricky. Because the renal threshold is a blood concentration. That means the renal threshold is the blood concentration of an analyte like glucose 
above which it stays in the urine. For example, the renal threshold for glucose is 180 milligrams per deciliter. If my blood glucose is greater than or equal to 180 milligrams per deciliter, glucose starts appearing in the urine. And why does that glucose appear in the urine if my blood glucose is greater than 180 milligrams per deciliter? Well, because my blood glucose is so high that I filter a ton of it, and I have a ton of glucose in the, in the filtrate, so much that it saturates my glucose transporter. I've hit my transport maximum. By the way, the transport maximum is abbreviated that. I reabsorb as much as I can, but still some remains in my filtrate and therefore appears in my urine. So that hit the renal threshold. The renal threshold for glucose is like 180 milligrams per deciliter. The renal threshold for many amino acids is, uh, is around 65 milligrams per deciliter. We reabsorb them. Uh, the renal threshold is a lot lower for them. So you can see we have these renal thresholds, which are blood concentrations of analytes, above which that analyte appears in the urine. All right, this is showing you, uh, this is really not showing you anything different, except for it's showing you um, glucose going back into the blood. Well, it's actually interstitial fluid. But real, okay, so come up here to this picture. I guess I should point that out. Really, when you're in the filtrate, you get and you're getting reabsorbed. Really, you enter the cell first, then the interstitial fluid, and then the blood. I mean, that's your pathway. Remember, you could be a paracellular route, or you could be a transcellular route. Remember that. All right. So if you take this cell and blow it up, look at this. This is my filtrate right down here. And I reabsorb sodium, and I reabsorb glucose, and I reabsorb amino acids. And where do they go? Well, they're in the cell right now. I put them into the um, interstitial fluid. And then where do they go? They go into the blood. So this is the reabsorption of uh, these analytes. I'm saying analytes. Analytes or sometimes metabolites because they're a product of metabolism. These are just, um, if they're charged, they're called electrolytes. These are just some generic words meaning um, these molecules. So this is showing you the transport. Okay, let's look at the Lupa Henle. The big thing about the Lupa Henle I need you to know is the descending limb reabsorbs water. The ascending limb is impermeable to water. But the ascending limb reabsorbs solutes. And something very special happens there. I'm about to show you. It creates a salt gradient in the medulla. This is showing you the Lupa Henle, and there's a special carrier I want to point out. It's called the sodium potassium 2 chloride carrier. All right, that's what it's called the sodium potassium 2 chloride carrier. All right, it's active transport. This is it right here. And this is happening in the ascending limb of the Lupa Henle. All right. In the ascending limb of the Lupa Henle, by tubular fluid, I reabsorb a ton of sodium, potassium, and chloride. Although I may return the potassium to the tubular fluid. In general, our bodies, our kidneys are really good at reabsorbing sodium but relatively poor at reabsorbing potassium. So we say that we are good at conserving sodium and poor at conserving potassium. And therefore, you got to eat your one banana a day because we urinate out a lot of potassium, but we don't urinate out a lot of sodium. All right. This um, sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter brings in two chlorides, one sodium, and one potassium. It's all symport. Now you're in the cuboidal cell of the ascending limb of the Lupa Henle. Okay, what next? Well, no, what next is this? I The sodium and chloride and potassium, well, the, put it this way. The potassium and chloride enter the blood, uh, or the interstitial fluid in this case, but eventually the blood. But the potassium has to turn around and be counter-transported with sodium. 
so the potassium actually returns to the urine all right the sodium potassium two chloride transporter the net effect of that is you reabsorb sodium and chloride that's the net effect is you reabsorb sodium and chloride okay now here's what happens Let's do the ascending limb first, so I can show you how this originally was set up. As a fetus, when your kid, um, you know, as a fetus, you know that as a fetus, you may actually urinate into your mother's amniotic fluid a little bit, but not much. It's not like you're producing urine all through the pregnancy uh, when you're a fetus. Towards the end, you might have a little urine produced, and you might urinate, but you're not drinking anything and you're getting all your nutrients from the placenta so it's not like your um, your kidneys are on overdrive or, or, or highly highly functioning at all okay but when you first start to move filtrate fluid through your kidneys here's what happens do the ascending limb first this ascending limb reabsorbs solutes only all right so it's reabsorbing solutes only. And this is the very first time this ever happens because that, that's where that's where this gets confusing. You're saying, well, how was that ever set up? Well, way back when you are a fetus, the very first time this ever happens, here's what happens. You start reabsorbing sodium out of your ascending limb. As you reabsorb sodium, as the fluid's moving upward, there's less and less sodium to reabsorb. So you reabsorb a lot of sodium down here at the bottom of the loop of Henle, and then there's less and less sodium to reabsorb as you move upward. And a gradient is set up where you're very have high osmotic, uh, have high salt concentration deep in the medulla, and then lower and lower as you move up towards the cortex. And there's a gradient, there's a salt concentration gradient in the medulla. It's very high down deep in the medulla, like 1,200 milliosmoles, and then less as you move up, 900 milliosmoles, and less as you move up, 600 milliosmoles, and less as you move up, 300 milliosmoles. Well, what does this gradient do for us? Well, what happens is now when your filtrate's moving down the descending limb of the loop of Henle, which is only permeable to water and not solute, water follows salt. So what's going to happen is my filtrate's about 300 milliosmoles. Right here where it's 300, 300, I'm not going to lose any water. That's isotonic. You, I mean, you're not going to have a net loss of water. But as soon as this 300 milliosmole filtrate meets a, a 400 milliosmole medulla, water leaves. Why? Because water follows salt. And this is 300 here and water left going towards the 400. Well, what that did was that concentrated my filtrate. I lost so much water that now my filtrate is 600. And when that 600 milliosmole filtrate meets a uh, 750 milliosmole medulla, water leaves because it's going from a 600 to a 750. But that further concentrates my filtrate. Now my filtrate's 900. And then when my 900 milliosmole filtrate meets a 1,050, say, you know, I'm just trying to cut the difference between 900 and 1,200 there, the water leaves, which further concentrates my filtrate. Now my filtrate is very, very concentrated, very salty because so much water left. Well, now it's so salty that as it ascends in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, I'm going to move the solutes out of the filtrate and into my medullary tissue. I'm going to enhance this gradient, and I'm going to dilute out my filtrate because I, now I'm removing sodium and chloride. I'm removing it, which dilutes my filtrate. And at the top of my ascending limb of the loop of Henle, my filtrate will be about 100 milliosmoles. Okay, so that's the loop of Henle, and that's the salt gradient in my medulla. And this is why we say the juxtaglomerular nephrons, I'm sorry, the juxtamedullary nephrons 
are even though there's only even though they only they are only 15 percent of the nephrons they are more important in concentrating urine than the cortical nephrons because the juxtam uh, medullary nephrons have these long loops of henley that dip deep into the medulla and encounter this salt gradient in the medulla and they can be uh, it's very important in pulling out water and concentrating your urine this picture is showing you the same darn thing but then it then what it does is it takes the 100 milliosmol filtrate you have at the beginning of your distal convoluted tubule and it says you know under hormonal control I might pull out more water and further concentrate my urine and of course this is under hormonal control by the way under hormonal control I might pull out sodium aldosterone tells sodium to come out so aldosterone will tell sodium to come out ADH will tell water to come out and I can further uh, change my filtrate composition there all right this is another picture showing you the same darn thing that's what it's showing you okay now I'm about to superimpose something on you all right look right here this is my loop of Henley as you know in the descending limb water comes out and in the ascending limb salt comes out that's what you know all right well there here's the blood right next to the loop of Henley if water's coming out all right if water's coming out of my descending limb then that water is going into my bloodstream and if sodium chloride is coming out of my ascending limb then that sodium chloride is going into my bloodstream that's what's going on here so this is the called the counter current exchanger that's what this is called and what you have to do is superimpose the blood vessels onto the onto the loop of Henle. and indeed they are superimposed on there the blood vessels are the vasa recta and when you lose water from your loop of Henle, that water enters your blood when you lose salt from your loop of Henle, that salt can enter your blood all right so that's what we're seeing here I thought I had a picture of it superimposed I do not so really these blood vessels are superimposed onto the loop of Henley okay this is going to show you the transport mechanisms of the distal convoluted tubule the distal convoluted tubule uh, reabsorbs sodium under aldosterone control and water can follow passively by osmosis but the reality is that you need aquaporins these water channel channels to open up for water to follow passively because remember that osmosis isn't the simple diffusion of water but it's really the facilitated diffusion of water through these pores called aquaporins that's what it really is so osmosis is the facilitated diffusion of water so aldosterone tells me to reabsorb sodium back into my bloodstream that's what aldosterone does water will follow as long as aquaporins are in the membrane ADH tells us to put aquaporins in the membrane so that's what's going on there notice that when I reabsorb sodium I secrete potassium notice that so this is actually important because aldosterone tells me to reabsorb sodium and I necessarily then secrete potassium because it's a counter transport this is an exchange pump right here all right so the more sodium I can serve the more potassium I waste but something very special can happen which comes up in the next chapter so I'll just allude to it today if your blood is particularly acidic
then protons can replace the potassium for the exchange. And you put the proton in the urine. Now that's good because you're acidic. You want to get rid of that acid. But then the potassium stays in the blood. So what I'm telling you is acidosis can lead to hyperkalemia, high potassium. Because if you have acidosis and you have high protons in the blood, protons can replace the potassium for this counter exchange right here. Reabsorb sodium, secrete protons. And preserve potassium and become hyperkalemic, which is not good. You don't want to be hyperkalemic. More to follow on that. All right, so this is showing you the aldosterone reabsorption of sodium. It's no different than we just said. The A means aldosterone regulates that. See, so the aldosterone is regulating that sodium reabsorption. I don't know what, the, what we're showing you is different here. I'm not sure what we're showing you different. Oh, I do know what we're showing you different. I do know. This is showing you the um, reabsorption of sodium that's not aldosterone regulated. It's not. This would just happen. It's not aldosterone regulated. All right. But this is showing you the aldosterone regulated sodium reabsorption. That's what this is showing you. And, and it's the same area, by the way. It's along the um, distal convoluted tubule. This is lining it up and just showing you both. It's saying, you know what, you'll reabsorb some sodium no matter what without aldosterone, and you will. You'll reabsorb some sodium without aldosterone, but you'll increase the amount of sodium we reabsorb with aldosterone. Absolutely. So that's what this is showing you. And then what is this? This is the, um, oh, this is showing you proton secretion and bicarb reabsorption. This is extremely important for the next chapter, the acid-base balance. So look what's happening here. I'm reabsorbing sodium like you can imagine. We already talked about that. And this is showing you that the protons can replace the potassiums like I already talked about. So if you're particularly acidic in your blood, the protons replace the potassium and you secrete the protons. In essence, you secrete hydrochloric acid, the acid. And that's a good thing that you're doing that because you don't want your blood to be acidic. In addition, in addition, I will reabsorb bicarb and buffer those excess protons. All right. So where did the bicarb come from? Well, the carbonic anhydrase reaction. There's carbonic anhydrase in my distal convoluted tubule cells. CO2 plus water gives you carbonic acid. That disassociates into a proton and a bicarb. The proton is secreted into my filtrate. And I urinate it out. I get rid of it. But my bicarb is reabsorbed into my blood and buffers more protons. So you can see that going on right there. In addition, we'll talk about this buffering system in our urine. Uh, ammonia in our urine can um, buffer our urine a little bit. Because here's how. NH3 comes from the deamination of amino acid plus an acid, H+. Plus yields ammonium, which combines with, say, chloride and becomes ammonium chloride, and we urinate that out. All right, so that's what, that's how we, uh, that's a, that's a ammonium chloride buffering of the, of the filtrate. Why do we want to buffer the filtrate? Well, Urine is typically acidic. It's typically pH of 5 or 6. That's acidic. But if it gets too acidic, things will start precipitating. And you'll get crystals precipitating out. And it actually could even lead to renal calculi, kidney stones. So you don't want urine to be too acidic or you get renal calculi, which is kidney stones. And that can happen when your urine becomes too acidic. So there is a buffer in your urine, ammonium chloride buffering system going on there. But we typically urinate out acidic urine, just so you know. All right, so we already talked about this, but uh, kidneys are huge in controlling pH. 
because of this reaction right here. It's basically this reaction. And this is the carbonic anhyd anhydrase portion of it. What happens is you can reabsorb bicarb if your blood is too acidic, and you can secrete protons if your blood is too acidic. Likewise, you can secrete bicarb if your blood is too basic, and you can reabsorb protons if your blood is too basic. So see, you can do both of these things. All right. Typically speaking, however, our bodies produce protons, and we need to get rid of them. I mean, it's not like we're always producing excess base. It's not like we're doing that. But we do produce excess protons. And when we do produce excess protons, our body can get rid of them through the kidneys. All right, this is the, um, oh, I know what this is showing you. Look at absence of ADH. Absence of ADH right there. In the absence of ADH, my 100 milliosmolar filtrate at the end of my Lupa Henle, so at the beginning of my distal convoluted tubule, doesn't reabsorb much water. Without ADH, no water goes back into the body. This does not occur. All right? So what does that mean? Well, that means it stays in my urine. And that means my urine stays dilute. 100 milliosmolars is very dilute. I mean, it used to be 1,200 milliosmoles down here. That was very, very salty. So what does it mean when it stays very dilute? We urinate out large volumes of dilute urine. That's without ADH. With ADH, my 100 milliosmolar filtrate that hits the end of my Lupa Henle or the beginning of my distal convoluted tubule, that reabsorbs a ton of water. All over the place I'm reabsorbing water. And as I reabsorb this water, my urine becomes increasingly concentrated. And I urinate out small volumes of concentrated urine. So this is the ADH story, the antidiuretic hormone story. In the presence of ADH, I reabsorb water and concentrate my urine. In the absence of ADH, I, re I don't reabsorb any water and I don't concentrate my urine. Hormonal communication generally begins with a part of the neuroendocrine system receiving sensory information and reacting by issuing a command to the body in the form of a hormone. In this example, dehydration is detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, which then directs or stimulates the posterior pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone, ADH. The next step is to transport the hormone molecules to target cells. This is typically done via the bloodstream. Here, ADH is transported through the bloodstream to the kidneys and blood vessels. When hormone molecules reach target cells, they will bind to matching receptors on those cells, and the hormone receptor complexes will trigger changes in the target cells. This causes the kidneys to reduce the urine volume output, thereby increasing water retention and countering dehydration. In blood vessels, vasoconstriction is increased, leading to higher blood pressure and thus countering the blood pressure drop caused by dehydration. Okay, I want to talk about one of those things um, said here in the beginning. All right, now, right here, recall that ADH is also known as vasopressin, all right, vasopressin. And he said in the video that, yeah, uh, low blood pressure will also cause ADH to be secreted. But it's primarily this osmotic concentration, all right? Your osmotic concentration only needs to change by something like 4%, and you secrete ADH. But your blood pressure has to change by 12% before blood pressure causes an, an ADH release. So even though ADH is also known as vasopressin, which... Uh, uh, are, which vasoconstricts and raises blood pressure. Its primary stimulus to be secreted is osmotic concentration. A 2% to 4% change in osmotic concentration causes ADH release. That's not a very big change. However, it takes quite a large change of blood pressure 
to cause ADH to be secreted. So that's a secondary stimulus or a, a side stimulus. It, it does do it. Low blood pressure will cause ADH to be secreted. But primarily what causes it to be secreted is, is being too salty, having a high osmotic concentration. All right, how does ADH work? Well, you're used to this. ADH is a, a, a peptide hormone, water-soluble, binds its receptor right here, activates a G protein, the alpha GTP, turns on adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is my second messenger. Now, let's stop right there for a second. What the second messenger is going to do is make sure aquaporins are inserted into the membrane of the renal tubule cell. All right, And it's going to make sure it's inserted into the apical membrane because the basal membrane always has aquaporins in it. In other words, this aquaporin is always there, but not this one. It's there under ADH control or not there under ADH control. All right? So... It would take a long time for cyclic AMP, oh, let me put it like this, let me say it like this. If cyclic AMP had to turn on a gene to make the aquaporin protein, and you had to do transcription and translation and then embed it into the membrane, ADH would take a long time to act. It would. You'd be forever getting that to act. So how does ADH act almost immediately? And the answer is, the aquaporins are pre-made and packed in vesicles. And vesicles are made of membranes anyway. This is a membranous vesicle right here. And all that ADH does via the second messenger cyclic AMP is tell these aquaporin-containing vesicles to fuse with the membrane. And that inserts the aquaporin into the membrane. Now, before ADH does this, water can't get into the cell. It doesn't matter how salty this cell is. It could be extremely salty. Water can't get in here because there's no aquaporins for water to travel through. But as soon as you secrete ADH, and, and ADH goes through its G-protein-mediated cyclic AMP production, the aquaporin-containing vesicle fuses, puts aquaporin in the membrane, and now water rushes in. And water rushes in. And water rushes in. So ADH affects putting aquaporins into the membrane. Now I want to point something out to you. Aquaporin 3 and 4 is always found in the basal membrane of these tubules, of these distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts. How do I know it's distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts? Because that's where ADH acts. ADH does not act at the proximal convoluted tubule. The proximal convoluted tubule has aquaporins in both membranes all the time. Okay. So, but the distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts require ADH to function. So when ADH is there, we put aquaporin 2 into the apical membrane, the membrane facing the, the lumen. And that allows water to get into the cell. The aquaporins 3 and 4 are always in the basal membrane. Water goes into the interstitial fluid. Water goes into the bloodstream. Okay, so that's the ADH story. Here's the aldosterone story, I think. Yep, this is the aldosterone story. Recall that renin converts angiotensin engine to angiotensin 1. Recall that the ACE angiotensin converting enzyme ACE converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Recall that angiotensin 2 tells the glomerulosa cells of the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. Recall that aldosterone goes to the kidneys and says reabsorb sodium. But the question is, how does it do it? Well, aldosterone is a steroid. And as you know, steroids enter the cell and bind intracellular receptors. The aldosterone binds its intracellular receptor, and this turns on transcription of a gene to make these, trans, these sodium transport proteins. So here's a sodium transport protein right here. Here's some sodium transport proteins right there. So aldosterone turns on the genes to make these sodium transport proteins. 
Now, let's look at something here. All right. By the way, see how the green one says anti-port? The red one says active transport. They're both active transport, but the green one is secondary active transport. And if you don't recall what that is, that's in Chapter 3. That is when you indirectly use ATP to cause this transport. How is the sodium coming in? Because the proton is going down its concentration gradient. All right. Well, how did that proton get there? Up here, well, this is showing you potassium, but it very well could be a proton as well. Up here, the proton came in via uh, active transport. Okay. So sodium gets into the cell via this antiport. Sodium gets into the cell via this antiport. It can either be exchanged with potassium or a proton. Sodium is reabsorbed with exchange of either potassium or a proton. All right. How did I get the potassium into my cell and the proton into my cell? Sodium is exchanged right here with either a potassium or a proton. And that uses ATP. That's a pump. Aldosterone turns on the transcription and translation of these uh, sodium transport proteins. Okay, remember, 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 the proximal convoluted tubule in the descending limb of the loop entity is obligatory water reabsorption. And the proximal convoluted tubule is 70%, and the descending limb of the loop of Henle is another 20 to tw about 20%, 25% even. Actually, let me just make it 25%. That's the highest it'll be. I'm going to the high end of this. In other words, your obligatory reabsorption of water is 95%. Your facultative reabsorption of water is another 4% because you reabsorb 99% of all of your filtrate. But as we talked about, that 4%, what's 4% 4 of 200 liters? That's 8 liters. That's a lot of fluid. So this 4% represents 8 liters of fluid. So your, your hormones can say reabsorb most of that or it can say don't reabsorb hardly any of that. Now, I don't know of too many people that produce 8 liters of urine a day, but certainly if you inhibited antidiuretic hormone long term, like you had diabetes insipidus, you would produce tons of urine because you're not reabsorbing this 4%. Okay. So obligatory and facultative water reabsorption. ADH is showing you ADH acts in the distal convoluted tubule. Already, we already talked about it. And the collecting duct, we already talked about it. This is a big collage picture from your book. I like it. I like this a lot. Uh, this is, see, this is why they call it the countercurrent. I've been waiting to get a picture of this. It's simplifying it, really. But see how the blood is flowing down? and the ascending limb of Lupa Henle is flowing up. They're going in opposite directions. So as the sodium chloride is reabsorbed here, it goes into my blood. All right, that's what's going on there. And it makes this blood more salty, correct? Well, yes, correct. Well, it makes that blood more salty. And the blood's flowing down through, and it's more salty. The blood's more salty. And now my blood is flowing up, and my descending limb of Lupa Henle is flowing down. They go opposite directions of each other. Well, because my blood is so salty right here, the water that comes out goes into my blood. And it makes my blood less salty. But it's this area right here around the loop of Henle that's this countercurrent mechanism. So that's why they call it countercurrent, because my blood is flowing the opposite direction of my filtrate. That's what they call that there. All right, these are things that are reabsorbed and secreted. Uh, do you have to memorize them? Hmm. Yeah, you, you, you really kind of do. So we can reabsorb all these ions. We can also secrete many of the same ions. Look, we reabsorb potassium, we secrete potassium. 
it's actually not showing you reabsorbing protons, but you indeed can if your uh, if your blood is too basic. Of course, that's not a common condition though. Uh, you can see that um, we reabsorb calcium, we secrete calcium. So you can see a lot of the same things we reabsorb, we also secrete. It's not just limited to one thing or another. Um, look at where there's no transport mechanism for. And that doesn't mean these don't travel across the renal tubules. They do. But there's no transport mechanism for them, so it's all passive. These move passively across the uh, renal tubules. So, you know, they go passively across. Urea crosses the renal tubules. I didn't say this to you, but urea is filtered because it's your major waste... Uh, uh, your major nitrogen waste product it's filtered but some of it's reabsorbed but there's no transport mechanism for it it's by diffusion only if there's a lot of urea in your urine some of it will be reabsorbed into your kidney tissue and if it builds up in your kidney tissue it'll diffuse back into the urine so there's no transport mechanism for that look at this things that we don't that if, if we fail to filter we can still secrete creatinine, ammonia, other organic acids and bases. Look at this. We urinate out neurotransmitters and histamine and drugs. We take penicillin and we urinate some of it out. Here are some um, metabolites that we uh, reabsorb. We filter these, but then we want them back because they're good things. We don't want to lose them. I mean, you don't want to take vitamin C then lose it all, so we reabsorb it glucose, amino acids, proteins, and vitamins. And this is where I talked about the transport maximum and the renal threshold earlier. There is a transport maximum and a renal, renal threshold for uh, these reabsorbed metabolites. Please, uh, do I want you to memorize any of these lab values? Huh. Nah, I'm looking at them and seeing if I want you to memorize any of them. I don't. You don't have to re memorize any of these lab values. Actually, yes. I, I take that back. Let's memorize um, sodium and potassium because it's going to come and become important next chapter when I do acid-base balance and uh, respiratory acidosis and alkalosis and metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. So let's memorize normal sodium potassium. Nah, let's not. The final word. Final word is don't memorize these. I'll give them to you on the test. I really don't want you memorizing them. I want you to be able to analyze them. There's no sense of committing these to memory. I will give you normal values on the test and make you answer questions concerning them. So you'll have to do the critical thinking part. You won't have to commit those to memory. All right, so these are some normal lab values for these things. Oh, I know what I want to show you. Uh, look at this. Look at how my your look at these waste products. Whoops, can't really draw a straight line, Kiggins. Okay, look at these waste products. There's hardly any of these waste products in the blood. Twenty-five. Twenty-five what? Twenty-five milligrams per deciliter. Look how much is in the urine. 1,800. So do I put urea in the urine? Yeah. I leave very little in the blood, and I put a ton of it in the urine. Creatinine. Look how much is in the blood. 0.6 to 1.5. Look how much is in the urine. 150. Do I put creatinine in the urine? You bet. I leave very little in the blood. Uric, whoops, sorry. Uric acid. Get back. Uric acid. Leave very little in the in the blood. Put it all in the urine. Ammonia. Really leave very little in the blood. Because this is toxic and leads to encephalopathy. Encephalopathy. Matter of fact, there's very little of that floating around because we convert a lot of it to, a, to urea. Remember, ammonia is converted to urea. But we do have a little floating around. We leave very little in the blood. We have a lot of it in the urine. And your renal tubule cells actually produce it. It's not like it, it was filtered from the systemic circulation for the most part. It was actually produced by the renal tubule cells. 
I do... Yeah, we're going to do a year analysis lab. Oh, you guys already did it. <laughs> you guys uh, already did a year analysis lab, so you already saw the pH. The pH of urine is typically acidic. That's why it's saying the average is 6. But it's saying it can go from 4 to four and a half to 8. I don't want you... Um, I don't want you memorizing all these lab values for your analysis. And again, don't memorize all of these. Please don't. Just gives you some, where some of the wastes come from. Um, tells you that. Okay. Don't run, don't memorize these your analysis values by any means. We run these in the lab and it's pretty cool, but you don't have to memorize them. All right, here's a summary of renal function. First of all, the glomerulus must filter. Glomerulus must filter. What doesn't end up in the filtrate are any cells or proteins. They're too big. Remember, albumin is right around the right size to fit through because your filtration slits are 9 nanometers, and albumin can run between 8 and 10 nanometers. Boy, that could fit through. But your dense layer is negatively charged, and albumin is negatively charged, and that repels its, each other. However, having said that, there could be a small amount of protein in your urine, especially if you had high blood pressure for some reason, even transiently, like working out, like exercising. Then you could have some protein in your urine just from having that high, high blood pressure through the workout. But not a lot of protein in the urine. Then your proximal convoluted tubules reabsorb 70% of the filtrate. Then your descending limb of the loop of Henle reabsorbs another 25%, and it's only water. The descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water. The ascending limb is not. And then the ascending limb reabsorbs solute. It's impermeable to water. And then your distal convoluted tubules in your collecting ducts are acted on by ADH and aldosterone. And under those, under those conditions, ADH leads to increased water retention or reabsorption, and aldosterone leads to increased sodium reabsorption. So that's what happens is the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. Um, the vasa recta, when I say it's reabsorbed from the tubules into the interstitial fluid, the vasa recta is then the bloodstream that picks it up. And there is a countercurrent multiplier here that maintains that medullary concentration gradient. This is maintained by this countercurrent mechanism. All right, and then you have urine production.